Welcome back everybody to Microbiology of Infectious Diseases. We've been talking about eukaryotic pathogens. And I'm going to talk about the last group, the helminths, which are pathogenic worms. And in particular, we're going to talk about the nematodes, the cestodes, and the trematodes. And we're going to give them also their common names. Uh, keeping in mind, these are eukaryotes, right? These are, in this case, because they're worms, multicellular eukaryotes that have a large complex animal structures, right? They've got digestive tracts, or at least partial digestive tracts, circulatory systems, etc. So these are, these tend to be very large. Um, and in a class of microbiology, you might wonder why we're talking about them. And hopefully you'll see why we're talking specifically about these or including them in this microbiology course. So just as a reminder, the worms are going to be in the eukarya, the domain eukarya, and they're going to be up here in the animals. So of the various pathogens, they're going to be the most similar to you and me at the cellular level, which does make treating them a little bit trickier. And they're going to be more similar to, say, the fungi and the protozoa than they are to the bacteria or the viruses that don't even belong on this tree of life because um, they're just not good enough. No, because they're not, uh, they're not alive and they don't really share much of anything genetically uh, or morphologically. You should remind yourself of the eukaryotic cell structure or architecture. Uh, this is something we talked about in an earlier video, as well as uh, the unique features of their genomes. And then let's put this back in context. We're talking about the three main types of eukaryotic pathogens. We had a video on fungi, a video on protozoa, and now we're going to talk about the helminths, like this little guy right here. So the helminths we think of as the roundworms, the tapeworms, and the flukes. Uh, those are the more common names that we hear. Now, in the adult form, they're macroscopic. They're very large. But in the uh, larval form, sometimes the larvae are microscopic and the eggs are always microscopic. And it's the larvae and the eggs that get transmitted. And for that reason, this falls under the category of microbiology uh, as opposed to some macrobiological form. So if we look at just a few images here, you can see some eggs of roundworms here. And like all other eggs, they're going to be single-celled um, unless they have a, an actual larva in them that's been fertilized. And we'll talk about the importance of the eggs. Uh, here's a tapeworm larva or larvae multiple uh, in someone's feces. And these are macroscopic. And then liver flukes, you can see a coin. I don't recognize that coin, but you figure that's you know the size of a dime or a nickel or something like that. And you see these large uh, leaf-like liver flukes. Uh, so there are egg stages, there are larval stages, there are adult stages. The adult stage is always going to be macroscopic. Larvae may be macro or microscopic. Egg stage is going to be microscopic. So let's look at each of these one at a time and I'll give you an example or two from each of them. Another name for roundworms is nematodes. Um, so if you keep the, the scientific name nematode in mind, but also recognizing very frequently, we'll simply refer to them as roundworms. And you can imagine where they get the name from. They're, they're cylindrical, like you see here in a cross section. I don't expect you to memorize all this, but the important thing is to recognize there's a reproductive system. There's a, um, an excretory system. There's a circulatory system. These are, in fact, animals. And so they're highly, highly complex. These are intestinal pathogens. They're very much overlooked uh, because in developed countries like the United States or the UK or Australia or Japan, um, they have been all but eradicated. We very rarely confront these in developed countries. And so because they're sort of relegated to the developing world, in particular the tropical developing world, they've really been neglected in a lot of ways. But look at some of these numbers. Current estimate is that greater than a billion people are infected with roundworms right now. That's more than one-seventh of the entire global population. So globally speaking, these are not minor pathogens. Here in the U.S., um, they've sort of fallen off our radar in a lot of ways. So if we go to a place like, like uh, uh, tropical Africa, where these are in, in high numbers, we are going to find that kids are more often infected than adults, and the severity of the uh, symptoms and complications is greater in children than it is in adults. So the morbidity is greater in, in children than it is in adults. For example, it, it's very well known that it stunts their growth. And if we can get rid of the worms, which there are ways to deworm people, all of a sudden they get right back on track with their growth. It also stunts or slows their learning, which you can imagine all the impact downstream on um, 
uh, uh, work potential, pay potential, etc. And so they're often referred to as being the cause of or part of a poverty cycle, where people in poverty are more likely to be exposed to these worms, and then once they get the worms, it keeps them trapped in poverty because of their stunted physical growth and their stunted learning. Some people refer to what's called the unholy trinity. It turns out that something like a billion people, or close to a billion people, are co-infected right now today with roundworm, hookworm, and whipworm all at the same time. All of these do fall into the nematode category, even though Ascaris is considered the roundworm. Uh, Necator is the most common hookworm. Trichuris is the, the most common whipworm. And these three will often co-infect people. There's a fourth that often co-infects people, um, but it's not part of this unholy trinity because you know, four is hard to have a funny, cool name for. It's Wuchereria, and Wuchereria is what's called a filarial worm. So there are round worms in the nematodes. There are round worms that have a hook. There are round worms that have a whip, and there are these filarial worms called the Wuchereria as well. This is an example of a handful of Ascaris, literally a handful, of Ascaris roundworms expelled from a child that had been given uh, a deworming agent called albendazole, and that child pass those worms through pooping, like just as you could imagine. Okay, tapeworms, also called cestodes. Tapeworms are a little bit flatter and they're segmented. So you can see a scolex, which is the head, and it's got this really scary looking uh, set of oh, essentially teeth called rostellum that help it really just to grab on. They're not actually eating or feeding that way. It's literally just to latch onto the intestinal wall. They've got a neck region and then a series of what are called proglottids. And proglottids are little reproductive structures. And the proglottids at the very end, depending on how long the tapeworm is, the, the last handful of proglottids are gravid, meaning they're carrying uh, fertilized eggs. And so these are the ones that are going to be breaking off in the feces and releasing the eggs out into the environment. So again, an intestinal pathogen, people pick it up through the consumption of eggs, often with pigs or cattle as an intermediate in between. These are endemic to Latin America, but can be found in a couple other places as well. Um, a good example would be uh, Tania solium, which causes a disease called cysticercosis. Also very uh, high numbers. I don't have the raw numbers in front of me right now, but very, very high numbers in the hundreds of millions of cases globally. Uh, when they're in the intestines, typically they're asymptomatic unless there's so many of them that there's physical blockage taking place. But then they move into the muscles and they get in the muscle tissue. Sometimes they can even be seen in the muscle tissue, um, but typically the patient is still somewhat asymptomatic. And when they get into the brain, if they get into the brain, uh, we see seizures, encephalitis, hydrocephalus, uh, and, and these can cause really severe um, disabilities. And often with the worms, what we see is that there's a low mortality rate. They don't typically kill. What they do is hurt and maim. So high morbidity, low mortality. You might think, oh great, low mortality. It means everybody's going to be just fine. But we saw already what happens with the morbidity associated with these and the poverty cycle. And that's the fact that people aren't dying from these is probably also a big reason why um, they're not getting a lot of attention globally. It's like, oh, well, they're, they're not dying, they're fine. But the, the overall disease burden is tremendous globally from all of these worms. Now, these, uh, these tapeworms, these cestodes like Tania, can get up to three meters let me move that out of the way. Three meters in the human intestines. These things can be absolutely enormous. You can see a picture of one that was expelled here with all the proglottids. You can see a close-up image uh, that's been colored with the, the scolex head and the, uh, the little teeth, so to speak, um, that are used just for attachment. There's no actual ingestion going on there. They absorb their nutrients uh, more directly through their skin. And the third category are the trematodes or the flukes, and they're divided based on what body region they go after. So there are blood flukes that tend to be found in the bloodstream. There are liver flukes that attack the liver, lung flukes, and intestinal flukes. They all have this kind of leaf-like structure in the adult phase. They're very flattened, very complex, right? Intestines, testes, excretory vesicles. Uh, a pharynx, esophagus, etc. Right, very, very much the complexity you expect from an animal. Probably the most important of the flukes is uh, is schistosomiasis caused by schistosoma. 
Uh, schistosoma is a blood fluke, sometimes referred to as a snail fever because there's a snail intermediate that's critical for the larvae to develop. Most of the 600 million cases, let that number six in, mo sit in, sink in, <laughs> most of the 600 million cases around the world are found in sub-Saharan Africa, about 90%. Fever, fatigue, muscle pain, cough, anemia, because they're stealing a lot of blood. Uh, growth retardation, like we talked about earlier with the other worms, undernutrition, cognitive delays as well, so you can see that poverty cycle that's going to happen, as well as pain. Nowhere in here do you see death. And so people aren't dying, they're being um, beaten up. Uh, the morbidity is really high and they're really taking a beating from these worm infections like the flukes like schistosomiasis. The larvae can be up to eight centimeters in length and they're found um, associated with or parasitizing these freshwater snails. People that uh, are farming in that freshwater come into contact with the snails and the larvae and they pick it up. The eggs are interesting because they have the spine and there's a little embryo in it. And as the embryo wriggles, the spine actually does intestinal damage and causes bleeding um, and can do quite a bit of physical structural damage to the, to the person that gets infected. All right, so what are some take home points regarding the helminths uh, in, in this context of pathogenic eukaryotes. Well, they're eukaryotic worms, so worms being animals, highly complex, eukaryotic, we know what that means at the cellular level. Uh, the nematodes are soil transmitted worms that include roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, and the filaria worms, and the filaria worms are almost always, maybe always, I'd have to think about that, mosquito transmitted, but these are often referred to as soil transmitted worms. Tapeworms are associated with eating, um, with eating beef and pork that hasn't been cooked properly. And then flukes can infest, and we use the word infest, not infect, when we talk about worms. Something to do with their size, but the terminology changes to an infestation as opposed to an infection. But flukes can infest the, the blood, the liver, the lungs, or the intestines, and uh, most of them require a snail intermediate like schistosoma.